Welcome everyone to this session on biodiversity and accounting. So we have uh, three distinguished presenters uh, present today for, for this session. And uh, first a word on um, for the people in the room. So on biodiversity and accounting now, but uh, maybe more later. So we have uh, so three uh, distinguished presenters. The microphones are very uh, sensitive. I'll pick up any ambient noise, so please be as quiet as possible. And uh, to the people attending remotely, uh, I'll put this in advance if um, there is some noise when people enter the room. Um, so we'll start start right away with uh, the presentation by Rémi Prudhomme. Rémi is a researcher at CIRA, the French Agricultural Research and International Cooperation Organization for the Sustainable Development of Tropical and Mediterranean Regions. And he will present today the results of a case study in Senegal where he applied the SGAP framework. And uh, Rémi, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, I will share my screen. Yes, you should be able to see my presentation now. So thank you, uh, thank you, Oscar, and thank you to give me the opportunity to present this work about uh, how can we introduce values in environmental assessments with the example of uh, of the ESGAP. So this work is done by a team in CIRED, uh, Aaron Lebrel, Adrien Comte, and Katia Sedel and myself. So first of all, uh, some word of context. Uh, I, will, I will follow the classic uh, plan of, present, of scientific presentation. So after the introduction, uh, I will present the method, then the results, and finally some some word of conclusion, so nothing very special uh, in this aspect. Um, so in terms of introduction, so the the state of the environment in Senegal is very well known and uh, quite, uh, quite, quite bad. We know that uh, one quarter of the agricultural non, uh, uh, soil is degraded. Uh, the 40,000 hectares are officially deforested every year. 87% uh, of the fishing stocks are overexploited and 187,000 uh, hectares burned uh, in, by, in bushfire in, in 2011. So the state of the environment is very well known. Uh, in Senegal, you have a different uh, way to assess it. You have a state of the environment, which is done every five years of very, uh, very high quality. You have also uh, sectoral assessments and you have uh, a very performant uh, national statistic agency, NSD, which uh, gather a lot of data on the environment. Uh, you have uh, also some environmental policies that takes place in Senegal to try to uh, fight uh, against this uh, this uh, environmental degradation. Uh, you have international programs, sectoral policies, and uh, national uh, policies. Uh, but still, despite uh, all these policies and these assessments, the the environmental uh, continue to to be degraded, so uh, we can ask uh, uh, how to, to perform a, uh, an environmental assessment which is able to, to, to conduct to transformative change. So that's one question we ask, and uh, about that, we, uh, we, the, the recent report of IPBES about, uh, about the value of nature uh, is quite uh, info informative. Uh, uh, there is a, a lack of uh, environmental assessment in southern countries. Uh, the type of assessment uh, is there is not a lot of integrated method used, and uh, the type of values which are uh, assessed are mainly uh, instrumental uh, values, and there are very few assessments done at a national scale. Uh, despite the fact that we we know that the national scale is a is a it's a level where you have a, a lot of uh, decision which are are done, so we try to fill this gap. 
and to perform this uh, natural assessment by uh, and and what we would like to do in with this uh, environmental assessment is to do an assessment which is able to to, to conduct to a, a transformative change so the here uh, it's another uh, figure uh, produced by the ip base in the value assessment reports where you they show that the 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 first uh, levers uh, to to produce a transformative change is to recognize the different values of nature uh, and then the second is to have a, a, an embedded evaluation in uh, inclusive decision making so it's also another point we wanted to to have in mind but in this presentation i will focus about only the the first aspect uh, the valuation of uh, the the recognition of uh, different values of nature in the in the assessment so the question we will ask in this presentation is uh, trying to show why uh, including values of of nature in environmental assessments is, is important and we will take the the example of the US gap senegal uh, because uh, we spoke uh, yesterday uh, and uh, today about uh, about the importance to to include values but here we will show that the the the, the how actually uh, it influences uh, the results of the assessment so in terms of method uh, as i said i will use uh, we we use the uh, gap uh, framework which is a uh, uh, which uh, produce a strong sun sustainability index, covers a wide range of uh, environmental issue and is linked to environmental objectives. So it's a uh, it's a good uh, uh, tool to to assess uh, the the environment and uh, with different uh, dimensions. Um, an, an interesting uh, aspect uh, with this tool is that uh, there is a it it presents uh, with a dashboard dashboard approach, which is uh, very convenient when you want to to use it in a participatory process, and uh, also it can be aggregated into a single number, and compare across countries and uh, easily communicated to politicians and publics so uh, it has uh, well uh, it can it's uh, it's a powerful uh, uh, tool uh, to uh, to produce uh, one number which can be uh, very easily communicated and also you have the temporal dimension but uh, i will not insist on, on this aspect uh, in this presentation so the os gap was already used in uh, new caledonia in vietnam and in uh, kenya so it's the first, uh, the fourth time uh, the the US gap is uh, is uh, used in a country. Here I uh, summarize the different step of the US gap process. Uh, so it's not it's quite different of uh, how it's described by the other study, but it's how we we see it uh, in the case of Senegal. So first of all, we choose the dimensions of the environment you want to assess then you you find indicators and you assess the database that support these indicators uh, then you choose the indicators uh, used to describe the dimension you want to to inform then you assess the indicators then you choose uh, environmental objectives uh, to describe what is a sustainable state for this uh, indicator and finally, to perform the aggregation, you have to, to give a weight between the different uh, dimensions. So as you can say in green, you have uh, all the steps where you have a, a choose to do, a choice to do, sorry, a choice to do. So here uh, it's, uh, um, it shows that uh, a lot of, of these steps are, uh, you, have, you have choice to do. So the, the question of the, of the legitimacy of the of the people who are doing the assessment and uh, and also uh, also the yeah, the 
the quality of the choice can be can be discussed. So um, you have many places to to have a participatory approach with this uh, with this tool. So here is the list of the different uh, dimensions and functions then uh, that you can uh, you can assess uh, in the original papers presenting the res gap. Uh, so you have 22 uh, uh, dimensions. So the dimensions are, are uh, on the right, and uh, and the functions that that are supported by this dimension are on the left. And uh, as you can see, it covers a wide range of uh, of dimension. And the first thing we did is to add uh, one dimension that is not already assessed, but uh, it's in uh, it's in it's ongoing, uh, which is a grass resource. And uh, here it was very important to add this uh, these indicators because uh, Senegal is in a semi-arid uh, climate, and the natural uh, ecosystem in this type of uh, climate it's uh, savanna. So if you want to assess the uh, uh, the natural ecosystem, you have to assess the, the grass resource. Then we assess the database based on uh, seven indicators. So I won't go in, in detail, but here you have a, a way to, to give a score to each database. And like this, you can have an idea of the quality of the database. It's, we, we, we assess here the quality of the database and not the, the quality of the method. So here you have a score on the method, but ju just to know if it's data based or if it's data based or if it's based on uh, uh, expert view or, or this kind of uh, things. So here it's the swing uh, type of indicators we can uh, compute with the with the rest gap. I will focus only on the first uh, indicator, which is a strong environmental sustainability index, which gives you the state of the environment for one date, and it's uh, different with the others. Uh, so I won't detail the, the other um, indicators uh, in the index in this uh, in this presentation, but uh, uh, we can discuss about it. And uh, how it's computed? So you you assess the state of the current situation for one indicator, and you compare it to a sustainable situation. And like this, you have a position between uh, five. Actually, we we don't go until zero. We go until five uh, for uh, computation reason. And uh, so you have a number between five and one hundred. 100 being the sustainable uh, state of the environment for this indicator. So, well, how you compute uh, it? So first you gather the, the data on the indicator, then you, standard, you standardize it and normalize it between five and, and 100 based on the, on the environmental targets. Uh, then you can proceed to an aggregation uh, between the different dimensions to have uh, this uh, this uh, magic number of the state of the environment in, in Senegal. And uh, here, something we added is we did a global sensitivity analysis on the weights and the, and the type of, uh, and the indicator which is chosen to inform each uh, dimension of the environment. Like this, we will be able to see how okay uh, if if we take a different weight, uh, compare uh, how it influences the aggregated score of the strong environmental sustainability index. So here's some results. So the golden. So we so we have twenty three dimensions. So one more than than in the in the other uh, less gap. Um, the quality, so you the, the database are of moderate qu uh, quality. Uh, so yeah, it um, yeah you can see that there is a, a an effort to do if you want to have a high quality data. Uh, 
And also here you have uh, 10 dimensions where we didn't find uh, any uh, indicator to inform it. Uh, five where we found uh, one indicator and eight uh, where we, we can, we have multiple indicators for one uh, dimension of the environment. So here it's the results. Yes. Uh, so as you can see here, it's uh, the different dimension of the environment. And here it's the score between five and 100 for each dimension. Uh, you, uh, and so it's the bars which gives you the score. And in, in, uh, in the error bar, they are representing the score of uh, other indicator that could be used to inform this, uh, this dimension, but, but uh, we didn't find that, we didn't choose them in a first approach. Uh, we preferred uh, one specifically. So you have three types of, uh, of dimension. You have the greenhouse gas emission where you have a high score, so a good state of the environment for the greenhouse gas emissions. You have uh, indicators like the natural and mixed world heritage sites, which uh, have um, a bad state uh, of the environment and not a lot of variability. So we are quite sure that the, the state is bad. And you have uh, this uh, indicator in between where you have a huge uh, uncertainty because the different indicators used to describe this dimension gives you very different results, very different scores. So the, when we aggregated it, uh, we found uh, an overall uh, OS gap score of uh, 31%. Uh, which is uh, quite uh, quite low, so it's uh, it's confirming the other study saying that the the state of the environment of the environment in Senegal is uh, is bad. And here you have uh, below you have the distribution of this uh, aggregated score uh, for uh, due to the sensitivity uh, analysis. So as I said, we did a sensitivity analysis for the weight which were between zero and one uh, uh, randomly chosen. And uh, also, yes, you, we, we, we took a different uh, uh, score for the indicator uh, for the dimension where you have uh, multiple indicators and a, a, a wide range uh, given a different score for one dimension. So, well, when you see this distribution, you can think that uh, you think it's okay. The, the weight is not influencing too much the results because the distribution is quite centered around the 31%. So it's a, it's, it's a, when you look at this research, you, say, you can say, okay, uh, it's a good news. We don't need uh, to have a participatory process because uh, the weight which will be given by the by the people uh, will not influence the, the, the aggregated results. Um, so yes, but actually, when you look at the influence of each uh, variable on this uncertainty, you have some uh, variables that are highly influential. So, which are responsible of this uh, uh, overall uncertainty. So, here on the left part of the graph, here you have the uncertainty, the influence of the uncertainty associated with the with the uh, uncertainty surrounding the the dimensions. So, when you have multiple indicators for one dimension, like uh, it's the case for soil resource or uh, uh, forest resources, you have a uh, high uncertainty. And on the right part, you have the, the influence of the, of the weight uh, given for one uh, dimension in the, in the aggregated uh, score. And uh, so it's uh, quite balanced between the two. And uh, 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 big results here is that, the, um, as you can see, the weight given to the natural 
mixed world uh, heritage sites and uh, in a lower um, way, but uh, the greenhouse gas emission, the weight given to the to the greenhouse gas emission is uh, highly influencing the, the aggregated uh, score. What does that mean? That, uh, that means that uh, if you give, uh, depending on the weight you give to these two indicators, you, have very, you will have very different uh, aggregated uh, score. Uh, and why is these two indicators? It's because you have extreme score for greenhouse gas emission. You have uh, uh, from 97% and for uh, the natural and mixed world heritage site, you have uh, 5%. So you have a, a extreme score and also a low uncertainty surrounding this, uh, these, two, um, these two indicators. Uh, another interesting result is that uh, you have a quite a big uh, uncertainty surrounding uh, uh, four uh, dimensions here, which are associated with uncertainty uh, uh, which difficulties to to inform properly these uh, these dimensions. So, in conclusion, I hope I'm not too long. Maybe no, it's fine. So, with the in the in the S gap, you have uh, four ways to have to introduce uh, participation to include a diverse value in the assessment. Uh, you in the choice of the dimensions like this, you can include the missing dimensions. You uh, you can uh, um, yes uh, use a participatory process to estimate the environmental targets, to choose the indicators that will be used to inform the each dimension of the environment, and to weight the different uh, dimension in the aggregated uh, indicator. Here we look only at the two last uh, at, at the two last uh, steps to show that uh, it's important to include participatory process in these two steps. The first step was to uh, was the importance of the choice of the indicator for one dimension. So it represents forty eight percent of the uncertainty, and uh, it includes uncertainty on the data. So, for example, you have some indicators. That uh, that have a, a low score, uh, but uh, with a high uncertainty um, because uh, the the database is uh, poorly informed, and uh, also it includes different aspects of the environmental dimension. So, for example, you have many ways to to measure to assess the sustainability of the forest resource, and also the weights of uh, also. Uh, uh, an importance. Uh, they represent 52% of the uncertainty, but uh, only the dimensions which are well informed and have an extreme results uh, have their weight, which is uh, influencing the, the aggregated score. So the, these two results are interesting because uh, uh, you don't have to, you, you are able with this. Uh, we show that uh, uh, you need a participatory process uh, for the weight to, to inform the weight, for example, but uh, this uh, participatory process will be useful only if you have good quality data and a well-informed uh, dimension. Thank you for your attention and uh, I am happy to answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Remy. Um... Uh, we are going to keep the questions for the end so that it's a bit more efficient, so to say. And also you have time to reflect on your questions so that you can reformulate it maybe. Um, and we will move right away to uh, the presentation of Alexandre Rambeau. Alexandre is a lecturer at AgroParisTech CIRED and is asso associate researcher at Paris Dauphine University and co-director of the Ecological Accounting Chair. And he's going to present the paper today. Well, he's going to discuss how mainstream accounting prevents from adopting a strong sustainability perspective. And he will propose a new ecological accounting paradigm with direct practical implications. And I hope I don't uh, um, 
I your betray your your presentation and your your thoughts, Alexander. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, um, thank you for the invitation and the uh, to to give me the um, ability to present this work. So uh, I take the liberty to um, not to use uh, slides uh, because, in fact, it's a conceptual paper, and uh, I I just want to um, be able to um, to highlight the key points. Uh, I will discuss some practical uh, consequences, but uh, in the end, and uh, my point here is um, just to uh, give a sketch of uh, the, uh, well, I know if it's a proof of the sketch of the paper, uh, and um, well, the, the different key points of uh, the reflection behind uh, this paper. Uh, so it's to open up debate, in fact. Uh, in, in fact, the, at the origin of the of this uh, paper and this reflection, in fact, is um, I mean two observation. Uh, first observation, uh, very classical observation, is the fact that uh, today the notion of sustainability is um, uh, tackled through uh, the notion of capital, uh, so natural capital, uh, social capital, extra. So it's uh, the capital approach of sustainability. Uh, and this, uh, this way of doing uh, was uh, criticized. There is a lot of critics of this uh, particular way to uh, tackle this, uh, uh, tackle sustainability uh, in this way. Uh, and of course, um, behind also uh, the capital approach of sustainability, the, there is this uh, notion, th these two notion of strong and weak sustainability uh with this question of substituability of uh, uh, capital uh, natural capital and uh, uh, human main capital extra so this is the first observation and uh in fact another observation which is here um much more uh, unknown uh which uh, comes from uh, an accounting viewpoint uh because my um uh, my field of research is in uh, ecological accounting and uh, in the theory of accounting in general. And in fact, uh, what is uh, interesting is uh, that this notion of capital is absolutely not defined the same way in accounting than in uh, economics. In I mean, in, well, a uh, lot of eco uh, economical theories. I, I, I don't want to... Uh, uh, make some generalities, but I mean, uh, generally speaking, in economics. Um, in fact, <clears throat> from, um, I mean, here, here again, a traditional accounting viewpoint, the notion of capital uh, is understood as a debt. And uh, this way of understanding uh, the notion of the capital comes from the uh, etymology of the term, because capital is a very old term which uh, uh, appeared uh, uh, during the antiquity uh, as a word to express the fact that um, uh, the, the word um, to express the fact that sorry uh, when uh, somebody borrows uh, money. Um, uh, there is the necessity to recognize that there is um, the uh, the obligation to refund these the capital parts of the debt in money. So the capital parts, uh, this notion, capital parts of the debt in money, is the origin of the term capital. And what is also very interesting is that this notion of capital as uh, um, a monetary debt uh, was created uh, to uh, oppose capital and interest. Interest war, uh, really speaking, uh, completely um, uh, forbidden in antiquity and uh, middle age, uh, here again, really speaking. And so uh, the notion of capital was, um, in fact, a, an administrative term uh, dedicated uh, to uh, express this idea that 
when uh, you uh, borrow something, you had to uh, refund it uh, without any uh, interest, just the capital part of the debt. Well, and uh, we know that uh, there is, uh, there was, sorry, there was a, a, a kind of um, uh, a, a shift in the meaning of the term capital at the end of the Middle Age, uh, where this notion of capital as a debt becomes synonymous more and more of everything which can be productive. And what is interesting is that in traditional accounting viewpoint, the notion of capital remains uh, capital as a debt, a monetary debt. So from an accounting viewpoint, capital is only a debt without any reference to productivity, to interest or anything like that. But uh, the notion of capital uh, as a set of productive things uh, become more and more something used and more and more used uh, in what I can call a more economic viewpoint. The, the, the question, and so uh, this notion of capital as a, uh, from a more economic viewpoint is the one used uh, for the capital approach of sustainability. So uh, from this observation, the question is why uh, did, uh, did it happen, in fact, at the end of the Middle Age and beginning of the uh, Renaissance, so beginning of the um, modern period? And in fact, what is here again uh, quite interesting, I think, is that it's completely uh, connected to a fundamental change in our anthropology. And so uh, the way that we shift from um, capital as a debt approach to capital as a set of productive things, so a set of assets, is here again connected to a particular way to conceptualize a uh, particular assumption on our world. What does that mean is that uh, <clears throat> uh, we know that the, um, uh, from here again, an anthropological, uh, anthropological uh, viewpoint, uh, the, um, the definition, I mean, of modernity, uh, modernity is character characterized by uh, what is called uh, the duality between nature and culture. And here, uh, I use uh, massively the work of, uh, for example, Bruno Latour, but also of uh, Cornelius Carceriadis, uh, who are uh, two thinkers uh, who uh, uh, attempted to connect, uh, at the same time, uh, an anthropological exploration of um, modernity and the connection with um, social and uh, ec economic realities. So, um, so modernity is character characterized, sorry, defined by this duality. What does it mean? It means that uh, from the beginning of the uh, modern period, uh, we made, uh, I don't detail the we, but it's an idea which was more and more, uh, which became more and more normal, that uh, <clears throat> there is the possibility to completely split our world in two perfect area. The area of nature, or in fact, the area of objective things, natural things, objective things, and the area of subjective things. And so it corresponds also with the, uh, the emergence of the notion of subjects, which was created during the well, the 13th century, uh, so at the end, very end of the Middle Age. And so <clears throat> this assumption is that everything in our world can be completely defined as objective and subjective elements. Uh, the area of the object, so the objectivity, uh, corresponds to something which is completely manageable, controllable, and that you can completely rep represent in a faithful way by uh, simple forms. 
And it also means that uh, you can control it by uh, simple laws and that science must uh, find these laws. Um, at the complete uh, opposite, there is the real the subject, so the subjectivity, which is defined by its absolute freedom, its absolute power on the world, and the uh, definition of subject is what is an end in itself. So the objects are mere uh, means, controllable means by scientific law, whereas subjects are ends in itself with an absolute freedom and absolute power on objects. And so <clears throat> the uh, modernity was characterized by this, uh, this uh, conception and it replaced complex networks of interrelations which were the basis of uh, what, what we can call the premodern anthropology with defined, so interrelation defined by multiple modes of existence by this um, uh, recomposition of simplistic uh, elements, objective and subjective elements. So now, what does it mean when we talk about this notion of capital and the evolution of the notion of capital? The idea is, here sorry, is to um, uh, understand that <clears throat> the capital, this evolution of the term capital, is completely embedded in this representation of the world. So the modern conception of capital as a set of assets corresponds to the idea that, in fact, the capital becomes more and more the symbolic representation of the absolute power of these uh, new, uh, new uh, uh, concepts that are subjects to so the absolute power of, of subjects, the absolute freedom to uh, control our world, and so the absolute possibility of development of subjects. And that uh, these, uh, the capital, the notion of capital, um, in the development behind this notion of uh, capital, the power uh, the, uh, represented by capital is supported by the objects that you can control in the way that you want. And so that the objects are the support of capital. It's in line with, for example, the definition given by Cornelius Cartoriadis of what is, what is capitalism. For Cartoriadis, capitalism is defined as an institution whose uh, central imaginary signification is the unlimited expansion of the rational mastery. It means that, according to Castoriadis, the definition of capitalism is not a social economic um, concept, is an anthropological concept uh, based on this idea that uh, what is um, uh, what is seeked uh, what we are seeking is uh, the permanent control of everything. So there is a permanent objectification in order to obtain a control. And so an increase of power, an increase of welfare, an increase of development of the subjects. And so that the capital, the notion of capital, the modern notion of capital is the symbolic representation of these dynamics. So now, <clears throat> what does it mean in terms of stability and in terms of natural capital? The point here is that uh, the natural capital comes from the idea that and the recognition that does this capital, this representation, this symbolic representation of the power of modern subjects comes also from particular objectified uh, things, which are in fact natural things. It meant nature uh, from a modern viewpoint is typically objectified thing that we, we, we uh, suppose that uh, natural things uh, are completely controllable, are uh, only means for the development uh, of the freedom, power, extra of human subjects. And so that uh, this notion of natural capital comes from the idea, the recognitions that, uh, well, in order to uh, 
uh, optimize the possibility of increase of the power and the development of human uh, these uh, uh, human subjects, uh, we need to include in the support of this capital these uh, uh, elements which are natural objects. So nature as objectified, and that we have to now uh, be more and more uh, conscious of the fact that we need to integrate in the definition of the productivity of capital, the uh, new types of the, not new, these types of particular objects with particular control, 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 controllability, sorry. So <clears throat> just to, uh, to conclude on this uh, point, it means that at the end, the notion of natural capital which emerged is not in fact focus on nature in itself because nature in itself from a, a modern viewpoint is a nonsense. Nature as Latour explained is only a matter of facts. It's a matter of style that we have to control in order to develop our power. And so natural capital from this perspective is just recognition of the fact that we objectify nature in order to uh, guarantee the, the exercise of a particular power. The question is um, how to um, go beyond this perspective and so to refocus on nature not on mere objects and controllable objects only for the mere, uh, I mean, uh, ends of human subjects and so to come back to something which is uh, as um, a philosopher, uh, philosopher uh, Brian Norton uh, explained, as a stuff-based viewpoint. Uh, here, in order to uh, come back to another perspective, and this is, um, uh, and I come back on the accounting perspective, um, one a way to, uh, to, to do that is to consider the notion of capital not as a set of productive assets, as a set of productive things that must, uh, which are here, controllable things here only to develop the power of human subjects, but in fact to consider that uh, nature, in fact our common world, uh, is uh, a matter of concern. Here again, if I um, uh, use the term of Latour, a matter of concern, and so is a new types of accountability. Accountability means a new type of debts. And so it's uh, useful here to use the notion of capital as a debt. And so consider that natural capital must be not viewed as, uh, from, I mean, an economic viewpoint uh, as here again, a controllable set of objects to develop human uh, power, subject power, subjective power, but uh, as a new types of debts, ecological debts that you can incorporate in our common accountability and that you can um, integrate in uh, accounting systems. Because as I said, accounting system are completely based on the capital as a debt. So now to completely conclude on this point, the idea at the end is to uh, explain the following things. It's, um, it could be interesting to uh, use the perspective on accounting on capital as a debt to uh, extend this particular way of thinking to integrate new types of debts and use the, the functioning of accounting and the functioning, uh, the, the particular functioning of accounting from this point to interact these new types of debts uh, in order to consider nature not, as I said, a matter of facts, some only objects, but a matter of concern with new types of accountability. And this is in particular the uh, project behind the care model. So care means the comprehensive accounting in respect of ecology. So we are uh, now practical uh, example, a practical application implementation of this way of doing. And so from this viewpoint, we have therefore uh, maybe a new way to tackle uh, this issue about how to integrate and generate new types of accountability 
towards uh, nature and to escape from uh, this particular uh, conception generated by the mainstream view of natural capital. So I will stop there and of course uh, will be happy to answer a question if uh, they are. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandre. <clears throat> um, we, in, in the interest of time, we'll move uh, right away to the third presentation. And uh, please uh, bear with us for the questions at the end of Paul's presentation. Paul Adji Lazaro is a macroeconomist of climate and biodiversity in the IFD research department. Uh, and he's doing a PhD at Université Paris 13 on nature related risks and opportunities in South Africa, right? So this is for now the title of uh, the paper. Your paper and your thesis. And today he will present a work in progress to assess uh, nature related risks in South Africa in a spatially explicit way. So it's a very ambitious work. And here you are. Thank you. Uh, so I hope to connect a bit uh, those previous shows to a more economic issue. And I think there are a lot of connections that we can discuss afterwards. Uh, so first, briefly, uh, the way I will approach the issue today, some really brief element of context, the general approach to assess natural at risk in South Africa, and then two types of results. First, exposure results, I will explain later, and then some spatially explicit results. So first, briefly, the context. Uh, biodiversity is declining. Uh, and some spots speak about the six extensions, etc. and biodiversity is declining also in South Africa. But it is a problem not only for biodiversity itself, but for humans, because biodiversity is the basic ground of ecosystem services of different types, on which rely humans, and humans is the main source of biodiversity loss, so the main source of ecosystem degradations and then of ecosystem services degradations through several types of drivers, mainly land and sea chain use changes, climate change, direct exploitations, and pollution. So a transition to a biodiversity positive economy will try to mitigate those pressures. So the objective of such, of such a transition can be can be called as a bending the curve of biodiversity. And this is exactly the symmetric goal of a low carbon transition where the idea is to curve the curve. <coughs> so both, um, sorry, no, <laughs> okay, the animation are real. So <laughs> there are two risks, physical risks linked to the degradation of ecosystem services and transition risks, <laughs> sorry for those animation, and transition risks uh, related to efforts to mitigate the footprints on biodiversity. And those both type of risks were the object of several and recent studies uh, that try to assess so-called biodiversity related risks or nature related risks and principally for finance. And my work and our work with Julien Calas and Antoine Godin are part of this broad research program on nature related risks. But we focus not only on finance, but on multi dimensional socioeconomic aspects that nature related risks could affect. This is a picture of the general approach where we try to assess how some biodiversity related shocks related to physical shocks, that is, for example, water depletion or de degradation of agricultural yields, etc., or transition shocks related to some regulation policies or changes in behaviors trying to mitigate the footprint of the economy, affects non-financial cooperation, so the industrial networks, and how those effects from biodiversity related shocks affect some different asset aspects of the socioeconomy, like financial assets, but also the capacity for, of households to acquire, uh, to, um, acquire goods, wages, unemployment, the capacity of the economy to raise foreign currencies and to raise fiscal revenues. So this is the general approach and a way to present the general issue raised in this kind of study. 
and in the case of South Africa uh, in, our, in our case. So before dealing with more uh, fancy stuff, just a little um, precision on the concept of vulnerability. One easy way of assessing vulnerability from an empirical point of view is to distinguish three dimensions of vulnerability. So to assess the likelihood of shocks, like the probability for a shock to, us, to occur, like the probability for water scarcity to, to prevail or to a specific policy shock to prevail. Third on the exposure assessment. In the case of natural related studies, it concerns how activities are dependent on ecosystem services and how activities are impacting biodiversity in the, and this is a proxy of how it, those activities will be impacted by changes, for example, in the policy. And then the third dimension is the sensibility the, or the adaptive capacity. If, for example, a bank is affected by a shock, if the, uh, the effect is on one person of its portfolio, the bank will have the capacity to adapt to the shock. So this is three dimensions to assess vulnerability. So here's a way to define the scope of nature-related studies. First, in green, whether the study is, is assessing physical or and transition risks, whether the study is studying finance, jobs, fiscalities, etc., and whether the study is uh, evaluating exposure only, so the dependencies and impacts of the agents of the economy, or whether the study um, assess the likelihood of shocks and the adaptive capacity. In the Simon Spring study, we, uh, we, we published last year for the French financial systems, we assessed physical and transition risks, the exposure of the French financial systems to physical and transition risks. So we only assessed the dependencies and the impacts of assets toward biodiversity. But in South Africa, we want to assess new socioeconomic categories still for physical and transition risks. And above all, we want to integrate some aspect of the likelihood of shocks. It will be clarified further after a while. This is now another view of the framework where it is more clear the kind of data we will use. For the nature related shocks, we'll use the anchor database for the dependencies of, on ecosystem services and some spatial data on the states of ecosystem services and the state of ecosystems themselves. It will be clear after what. For activity, we'll use an input output tables and a map of economic activities within South Africa. And for the socioeconomic exposure, we mainly use the socioeconomic satellite accounts of the input output database. But and also with additional financial data uh, from uh, different sources. So now some results. Uh, let's see. So first, some results on exposure. Uh, so the idea is to use mainly the input output database. So this is an idea of how combining the input output database and the anchor database on ecosystem services help us to identify what are the sectors the most dependent on the 21 ecosystem services covered. So on the left, you have the most dependent sectors, that is the agricultural sectors in green. And then on the right, you have mining related sectors, manufacturing sectors, and services sectors that are less dependent on specific ecosystem services. Uh, but for example, the water related services on the top are a kind of services on which depend a lot of different sectors. And the kind of result we can derive from, from this analysis is that, for example, exports, exports in South Africa is, are heavily dependent on ecosystem services. Like approximately 80% of exports are highly dependent on at least two ecosystem services. So this is the first proxy of how the capacity of South Africa to raise foreign currency depends on specific ecosystem services. And this is due to the sectoral composition of uh, exports, because exports, at the different of the other types of socioeconomic categories, is heavily reliant in South Africa on mining and manufacturing products that are more dependent on ecosystem services. That's why we observe we derive these high uh, dependencies for exports in South Africa. And when we look at specific ecosystem services, we can derive that for example, that 80% of South African net exports are generated by activities highly dependent on surface water. And this, so this is a clue to understand that water scarcity problem 
could have deep impact on the trade balance of South Africa and then on the capacity of South Africa to import uh, stuff. So, but we can do the same uh, job for every type of socioeconomic categories and the 21 types of ecosystem services. But we can also assess indirect dependencies and indirect effects, for example, pollination. Pollination is a service on which depend only few agricultural sectors. But when we look at the sectors that depend indirectly on the sectors that directly depend on pollination, we find that a lot of food industry sectors, for example, depend directly on pollination. And then so the, the degradation of the pollination services would imply some effect on final demand, on household demand, through price increase or quantity constraints. This is now for transition risks. So for, we will look at we look in the study at seven different types of pressures on biodiversity. We do not translate those pressures into uh, biodiversity metric. We stick at the multidimensional assessments of how different industries affect biodiversity through climate change pressures, land use, pollution, and resource extraction. We identify some case sectors for different types of for those different types of pressures. And then we assess how those case sectors locate or contain the different socioeconomic variable we are assessing. So for example, case sector for water use uh, contains 7% of household demand, case sector for acidification pollution generates 9% of exports, and case sectors for cropland use, for example, employ 3.5% of jobs. And again, we can try to look at indirect effect. And here, as a case study, for example, it is interesting oh, <laughs> to, to compare forest and fish, but let's see. The oh, most important, interesting part. Probably because it's my computer. Uh, maybe. How long is it? Uh, five, five more minutes. Okay. okay. So for the spatial, the spatial species assessment, uh, for the exposure assessments, we only know how different industries and then different socioeconomic variables are dependent on ecosystem services or how they are affecting biodiversity. This is this our first way metric to approximate the exposure to such shocks, but it's not really convincing. For example, if you are dependent on water, but in a location where water is unlimited, you are not so vulnerable to water. You are only dependent on water, but they are imagine in Norway versus in Sudan, uh, two industries with the same water use are not vulnerable to water scarcity at the same uh, at the same uh, at the same extent. But to assess the likelihood of shock, so the like the probability for a water scarcity shock to occur, for example, we have to look more into details into the location of economic activities and assets and that's what we do uh, for in this in this paper for one kind of physical risks water related physical risks and one kind of transition risk that i will uh, present afterwards so the main idea is to combine geographical data of biophysical stuff for the likelihood of, of shock and spatial data on the economic activities to see where some shocks occur, if the economic activities that are at the same place are exposed or not to the shock that occur in this place. So this is a presentation of the economic data we use. So in South Africa, we have the industrial structure and the amount of production of more than 200 local municipalities. So this is a way of illustrating uh, the database. And so we combine those economic data with two types of biophysical data to assess the likelihood of shocks. For one part, for the physical shocks related to water is how water is scarce in some places. And for the uh, transition shocks, we look at where are located threatened ecosystems, more precisely uh, terrestrial ecosystems that are vegetation types. But this is only for the example. So this is the result for the municipality level water risks, water shortage risks. So this is the way of looking at if each municipality is more or less prone to be affected by water shortage. And this is to compare to the image of the economic activities that depend on water. And this, um, 
This ensues from our dependency analysis before, but now we combine it with a likelihood of shock assessment, and we ask then how much production, for example, 10% of cell significant production is vulnerable to water shortage in the sense that 10% of South African production is simultaneously located in a water scarce municipality and in a sector which is highly dependent on water. This is the definition of vulnerable to water shortage. And for example, we find that 20% of South African exports are vulnerable to water shortage. So if you remember, we come from 80% 80, uh, 80 of exports dependent and exposed to physical shocks to 22% of exports vulnerable because located in by, uh, by uh, generated by activities located in vulnerable municipalities. And we can map what are the sectors uh, that underline those, uh, those figures. And even identify some critical municipality. For example, in Kama, 82% um, of production is vulnerable to, to, for, to water shortage because the municipality is vulnerable and the productive structure of the municipality is profoundly um, as to dependent activities like agricultural activity and mining activity in this case. Last but not least, a way to assess in a spatially explicit manner the risk of um, transition shocks. And this so relate to transition shocks related to the production of threatened ecosystems. So we have this map of where are threatened vegetation types in South Africa. And we know approximately what kind of pressures or pressures, like if it's more agriculture pressure or mining pressure or invasive species that are at the source of the threatening of each species uh, threatened in South Africa. So the idea is quite the same as before, is to compare where are municipality where ecosystems are highly threatened. And here, for example, is for mining activities. Those are the municipalities where a lot of threatened ecosystems still exist and are threatened by mining. And this is the output level of mining activities. So the idea is to look at where are mining activities and what kind of mining activities are located in the municipalities where there are ecosystems threatened by mining activities. And for example, we found that almost the half of mining production locates in municipalities highly covered by mining threatened ecosystems. And last result, it is not because different types of mining activities are not evenly distributed across the countries. Uh, it is different mining sectors that are more or less vulnerable to ecosystem protection. For example, the coal sectors, uh, especially, is quite vulnerable to production of ecosystem services. And this I like to clear overlap with the, um, the climate issue, uh, naturally. But it derives from, from the fact that coal mines are more are more located in municipalities where there are spaces threatened by mining than other types of mining activities. For example, gold mining, we find that gold mining is less exposed or less vulnerable now to uh, transition shocks intended to protect ecosystem. So yeah, here, 80% of coal mining activities and uh, five, uh, 50% of metal mining activities are located in what we call sensitive municipalities, that are municipalities with high extent of um, threatened ecosystems by mining activities. So this is my conclusion. Uh, the adaptive capacity stays a new frontier of nature-related risk assessments. There are many limits to the, to the as evaluation I just shown, but yeah, this is the last piece of work, uh, even if there are uh, enormous progress for the one I presented here. Thank you. Okay, so as you could see, three very different uh, presentations and three very different points of views, more philosophical, more uh, financial, more economic and uh, uh, life science oriented. Um, and I hope that we will able to link them together in the questions and the discussion. So I've seen lots of links with yesterday and I'll turn to the audience first to see if there are some questions. Please go ahead. Sorry if I misunderstood something, but I'll try to connect the first two presentations a little bit on this. 
uh, because I think it's very interesting the perspective of what okay, uh, not talking about capital as something productive, but as a debt, like uh, these uh, turning to this perspective. But it, at, as far as I understand, it also creates some constraints that we, I don't know how to deal with this. For example, if you take the various class perspective, a meridian perspective, perspectivism, uh, he will look at the, uh, we, can, we, we cannot say, talk about one debt. We have different debt according to the different societies, the different cultures, different, and for example, if we're talking about deforestation, as far as I understand, deforestation would be a debt. Uh, deforestation will have different meanings, different, it will be different kinds of debt if you compare like uh, rice producers in Amazonia and um, uh, tri tribes that de de depends on these forests to, to live, basically. So it's going to be like a kind of very kind of different debt. I don't know how to address this. This is more a question to Alexander. Uh, and moving from something very similar to the, the first presentation, uh, the, it's about the aggregation because it's the same, same issue. Like uh, when you're thinking about aggregation, you need to think, okay, how to give these weights? If you're thinking about like uh, participative, if, if I understood well, maybe I'm wrong, uh, you're getting, going to take like a whole the society should eat as something important for them. For example, you're adding here the grass. Uh, what's the name? Grass. Yeah. <laughs> uh, grass resources because it's important for, uh, for Senegal. But uh, if you're thinking again about forests, uh, you have like some, some forest or the forest will be very important for one. one Kind of society or for one group of the society and much less important for others. So for example, you are constructing you are building a hydroelectric power point, a power power plant in the middle of Amazonia again. Uh, for the society that depends on this space is something that's very important, but for the for the whole country, this uh, this energy is, will be very important as well. So how to you cannot just give one uh, wait for like one people, one uh, one vote in this aggregation. I don't think it's possible to do this otherwise. Like uh, it's not one people, one vote because like for these forests are much more important for this society. They, they will disappear, but we are saving or like creating a, a lot of benefits for those that are not living in this area. So I want to listen from you a little bit more on how to aggregate and consider these different. A little bit related to the perspective. I believe there was a question uh, behind. And just um, Alexandre will have to leave us before the end of the session. So maybe you can direct your questions to him first if you have some. Okay. I have one two questions about each of them. Very short. Sure. Okay. Uh, one question about Amy. Thank you very much. Uh, how do you define the, the, the thresholds of uh, unsustainability you know, for each indicator? Uh, a question for Alexandre. Is there a link between your approach, your interesting approach, and, for example, what Polanyi says when he says uh, capital is in economy and economy is embedded in society and society is embedded in nature? You know, the Polanyi approach of embeddedness. I think it's close to your uh, analysis. And a question for Paul. Uh, thank you very much. What is my question? Yes, uh, you, you can define uh, vulnerability. Is it possible for South Africa to define resilience to this <laughs> the next step you know, to this vulnerability? Thank you. And if I may, I also have one question for Alexandre, uh, and I leave the other for the rest of the discussion. So just so that the questions are all put in a bundle so that you can answer them before you leave. Um, so for you, Alexandre, uh, Remy presented an aggregate measure of a gap of sustainability. Um, and some, uh, such as André Banoli, have proposed that this gap could, in fact, be used to compute a monetary measure of natural capital that is compatible with a strong sustainability perspective. Uh, so, uh, in your perspective, does this make sense and does it uh, fit with your um, framework that you present in your paper? Okay, so uh, thank you very much for all these questions and uh, 
very interesting and relevant question. So um, I will do my best to uh, give uh, short uh, answers, uh, but uh, well, to here again, op open, open debate. First of all, um, uh, I, I want to um, to uh, preside that the, the 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 fact that um, oh sorry oh. Oh, sorry, problem with my okay. Um, so that um, if you want uh, more detail uh, on um, practical uh, methodological details on the K model, you can um, uh, go to uh, uh, at the same time the the, the site internet site of the um, ecological accounting chair, uh, but also on the um, uh, the the site of uh, the website. Uh, of the CERCES, le cercle, cercle des comptables environnementaux et sociaux, uh, which is an NGO which uh, federates uh, the community behind uh, these uh, ideas, and uh, in particular uh, professionals which support these uh, types of ideas, because today there are more and more experimentation and missions inside a business to uh, implement this uh, uh, this idea. So it's just an introduction. So uh, to to answer uh, <clears throat> um, the uh, the question of the, the the debt and in fact accountability, which is accountability, is a central concept in uh, accounting studies. So it's uh, uh, at first from uh, I mean a conceptual viewpoint is uh, to to have a partial mindset and and to uh, to shift from a perspective when you uh, tackle, uh, for example, nature, but it's also the same thing with human beings as mere assets. And so to, um, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to capture them, them uh, as uh, productive things, but uh, to uh, ask a question. So uh, uh, what does that mean to consider them a matter of concern? So it's first point, it's that. Then uh, from a more methodical viewpoint, uh, we do several things. The, the first thing is that in a completely uh, Latourian uh, way, uh, we try to uh, capture the translations. It means uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the network of translation. So the question is, well, we have um, a particular entity, a natural entity. Uh, we have uh, a, a business activity. So you have a firm, for example. And so uh, uh, be, uh, <clears throat> between the, the both, uh, what are the different types of translators which are here to uh, not to faithfully represent something, but which are here to really translate something. And so uh, how we connect uh, the firm with the entity and what are the uh, even the political uh, network of translation uh, which connect the firm with this entity. So we did that for, uh, for example, the climate, where, where for uh, water ecosystems. And it's uh, very interesting because um, it um, uh, becomes much more um, clear for um, people in business activities to understand all the complexity uh, uh, around natural entities. Natural entities appears no more as mere set of indicators that you have to manage. No, it's um, uh, something much more uh, said complex and uh, much more entangled into uh, 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 other uh, entities uh, inside the society, in fact. So this is another point. And uh, also to answer another question if I'm in the, the same, uh, same way. So uh, we have also to define uh, baselines uh, for the preservation of uh, natural entities. So this is something which is uh, quite natural in ecological sciences. And uh, for, for example, uh, the definition of um, uh, ecological impact assessment is based on the evaluation of baselines. And here the point is to um, uh, assess uh, uh, what is called good ecological state of ecosystems. It's uh, quite difficult. And here we use uh, in particular what is called ecosystem-centered accounting systems which is also developed in the uh, uh, ecological accounting chair um, in order to um, uh, discuss with uh, different actors on social economy, uh, social uh, ecosystems, um, what are from a scientific, but also 
uh, political viewpoint, uh, what are the, the baseline that we can choose uh, for these new types of uh, preservation and, and uh, accountability. So it, it just to give you a, a sketch here again of the, the way we uh, we work. And uh, just to finish on my, uh, my uh, answers um, uh, about the, the work of... Um, of uh, Vanoli in particular. Oh, there is a question about Polanyi. Uh, it's uh, uh, just so uh, for Val Vanoli. In fact, the problem is not the monetization because it uh, depends on what does it mean to monetize something. If you want to monetize the productivity of the thing, and so if you want to capture a kind of market of, uh, if you want to objectify the productivity of an asset, here is a problem. But now, if you tackle monetization in the way that you want to assess the precise cost of the activity to respect and to preserve uh, the baselines uh, of these uh, natural uh, entities, uh, it's absolutely not the same thing. And so uh, this was the case with uh, Vanoli, which introduced uh, in um, uh, national accounting, uh, this idea that we have to record in national accounting systems uh, the cost uh, for um, the preservation the preservation code that we didn't record it and that we have to record it. So it's um, uh, ecology cost, uh, uh, sorry, um, co-ecologic non-paid uh, non ecological cost. And just to uh, finish, sorry, uh, about Polony, yes, it's quite close to the position of Polanyi. But here, even Polanyi, and it's quite normal, uh, tackle the notion of capital through this idea of capital as a set of assets. So uh, this notion of capital as a debt is uh, unfortunately not very well known in a lot of uh, debates, uh, economic, but also um, political debates. Uh, when we uh, use the term capital is uh, in the, man, in the uh, main cases, synonym of uh, a set of assets. But, well, uh, Polanyi is an intersection, I mean, of, the, of these two worlds. Be very quick. So thank you again for the questions. Over to you, Remy. I think your question was addressed to you. Yes. Um... So the first question about uh, one people, one vote, how you use uh, race gap uh, everywhere and, and with this part participatory. So um, the first thing was to, to show where the area of, of uh, where the difference between uh, science and policy. And I think in the race gap, uh, it's very clear. Uh, and, uh, and you have a tool uh, to disangle disentangle to to split the the political part and the and the and the science part and uh, so that's that's the first thing and it was already said yesterday for, we have to as a scientist we we have to know where to stop uh, in our uh, our recommendation and when it's uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's the role of policymaker to to have a choice or anyone else than a policymaker. So I, I, I wanted to show that. Uh, and at the same time, uh, what I wanted to show is that it's, it's very linked. So for example, it's useless to give choice to, to, to a policymaker if, we, if you have a big uncertainty on one dimension. It's what we, what, what was shown by the, sensitivity analysis, the, the, the weight you give to, to a dimension which is highly uncertain is, is, uh, do, do, does not influence the uh, aggregated score. So that's why the, this link between science and policy that I wanted to show. And then for the participatory, I agree with you that you can't ask everybody to, to to, to take part in the participatory process. And I think it's not the purpose. You can have many different ways to use it. You can, first thing I think is to, is to use it with different type of actor. For example, I'm quite sure that AFD, uh, Senegal government, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, well, an environmental uh, NGO will have completely different uh, weight between the different uh, dimension of the environment. And uh, it can show, for example, uh, some disagreement on uh, on specific values, for example. So it's uh, it's it's uh, just to be transparent about uh, uh, what is uh, can be computed by science and what is uh, uh, a policy uh, a policy thing. Um, I hope I answer to your question. And the second point about the, how you fix the unsustainability for each indicator. So actually, to you have two type of uh, of limit or targets. You have a policy target that are fixed by you can take it in the in policy already existing. For example, in Europe, you have uh, zero deforestation. You have this kind of uh, of policy targets. You can also have a science-based target. For example, you can say that a resource is at its balance when the when the renew when the increment is equal to the to the destruction. So you have a balance. Uh, so it's a it's a mass balance. For example, in the, in that case, and and also you can be in face of very difficult choice where you have to do a almost arbitrary arbitrary uh, choice. Uh, and in that case, I think it's uh, it's not to the modeler to or to the assessor to do it, but more to the people who are using the assessment and who are relying on the results that has to do this kind of choice. So, and, and even for political choice, you, you can not be agree with a, a political choice. For example, Senegal can take a, a different climate uh, target than the, the one decided in the, in the Paris Agreement, or maybe not because they are in the agreement, but uh, they can interpret it uh, differently or this kind of thing. So, uh, yes, I hope uh, I answered to your question. And maybe for the resilience uh, questions, I think there are two levels of answer. The first is, uh, is adaptation, whether you adapt from an ecological point of view, like building some adaptation to secure the water sources, for example or from an economic side, um, like, for example, concerning the exports uh, problematic to diversify your, your export, uh, export outlets. So this is the adaptation part. But there are also opportunities uh, of taking it. For example, in South Africa, uh, you can be resilient in protecting biodiversity to uh, uh, develop tourism around biodiversity, and this would be even not a natural outcome of, of the biodiversity issue, but even a, a positive one. So yeah, I think we can think we can think of resilience from an adaptive adaptation point of view or an opportunity point of view to make it. Um, and more reaction here in the room. So we are still a bit early for the next session. So I'm, I'm sure everyone wants to head uh, right to the plenary, especially if you're part of the, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, the speakers. So uh, please feel free to join <laughs> the panel if you have to. Um, otherwise, I, I, also, I have one more question for, for you uh, to try to make this uh, links between the different presentations. There is one more link I see here. Um, uh, you say you want to disentangle policy targets from science-based targets and that the SCAP can help doing that. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's so clear cut. Uh, we are dealing with uh, complex ecological systems that have not one uh, limit, but more a kind of frontier associated with a higher or a lower risk of collapse or extinction or shift in, uh, in functioning. Um, and here we can make a link, I think, with the presentation of, uh, of Paul. Uh, this notion of risk is of interest, I think, for economic systems as well. Um, but I think it's a case for uh, uh, most of the 
dimensions of the ethka. You have a judgment associated with it. Uh, it's not a pure objective decision to decide what clinic is. And I think it's uh, useful for each of the, well, I would be curious to see whether each of the component could be strengthened or uh, made more legitimate by using uh, ex not only expert judgment and scientific judgment, but also uh, political judgment or uh, more social preference type of judgment. Well, uh, um, intelligence of, of, of the great numbers, like uh, asking more people to uh, have an opinion on this or that level of risk associated with this or that target. So um, do you see a progress that uh, in the methodology of the SGAP in this direction? And this goes uh, also in the direction of your uh, um, research question of whether uh, we could have different um, kind of uh, preferences associated with some of the targets, some of the weights. Does my question make sense or can I make yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, so as I said, I think there is many, well, I'm not sure I understood. Is, your question is that actually, well, I will summarize it very badly, but to be clear, uh, there, there is not really a science-based target because uh, you you have uh, it's uh, at the end it's a matter of choice and uh, it's mainly political, right? If I yeah, so, yeah, so you have policy uh, elements associated with all of the targets. Okay. Not purely okay. Yes. Yes, that's why I I think it's interesting. In it, what is interesting in the US gap is that you have this different way of introducing a participatory process, and and you have political uh, po uh, political uh, implications. So you have you have the the choice of the dimensions. You have the choice of the indicator. For example, for 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 the forest resource. You can take an indicator in terms of of area, in terms of of wood production, uh, in terms of uh, you have many. In terms of do you want natural uh, forest or exploited forest? You have many uh, different aspects of the of the dimension that can be covered by many different um, indicators. So the choice of the indicator is also a, a political uh, a political choice, and and also then you have the the targets, as you said. Uh, I I think some yes you can you can fix different targets, and even if they are science based, at the end you have to choose between different uh, science based targets. For example, for the quality of water, you can say okay we want uh, you, you take the the, the most vulnerable uh, people who are the pregnant women uh, for the case of uh, drinking water, and uh, you here so far in that case you take a very low level of nitrate, for example, in the water, and and it's a, it's your target. Or you can say, okay, in average, uh, the population can can drink. Water with with a higher level of of nitrate, so you take a, so at the end it's it's probably a question of risk. You're right, uh, but but what I find interesting is that in the age gap you have this uh, you have a, a very clear method to have different uh, way to introduce uh, values or and and policy choice. And uh, a very, it's a very transparent method, and uh, with the dashboard, uh, uh, as you can see, it's a very uh, transparent, uh, a very transparent method to to assess uh, the different dimensions. But I think that we should only sh show the 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 dashboard with all the dimension uh, disaggregated. Uh, when you present an aggregated uh, uh, OS gap with the uh, aggregated score, uh, well, you make big assumption about the weight and all that, and that's uh, 
I think that can be a, that can change a lot the results uh, as uh, as I should. Thank you, and I think we'll end here and head to the next panel. Thank you, Remy, and thank you, Alexandre, left. Thank you, Paul. And I'll see you at the coffee break, maybe or later. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. See you at the coffee.